back to the 21 Convention 2017 of Orlando, Florida 10 year anniversary special event. We're on day three of four, having a really, really good time. Our next speaker, first speaker of the day, is at this point a friend of mine. Still a pretty new friendship, been about a year. Last year in Orlando, Florida at the Under 21 Convention was his first presentation at our events in, uh, here in Orlando. When I invited him, I was just looking for a really good style speaker, not fashion, style. And that's all I really invited him for, and that's all I intended him to be at the event. But when he attended the event, he A, warmed up to the alumni speakers rapidly, and they loved him, including to this day. But above and beyond that, he had connections to the group of speakers you guys see now here at this event, this whole new group, the Red Pill community, that I had no idea. So it was a massive benefit that has helped transform this entire company and event. Without further ado, please help me welcome Tanner Guzzi to the stage. Thanks, man. Welcome back. Thanks. Morning, guys. How are you? I am excited to talk to you today about something that men hate to talk about, which is our clothing. So we're going to see how this goes. But I've actually, I've been taking a gauge of how you guys are as I've paid attention over the last couple days as I've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of you guys. And I'm excited because I can tell that you're a receptive audience to this concept. And in a lot of ways, that's such a good and a beneficial thing because any resistance that you guys have to growth or improvement in any regard is going to impinge your ability to grow and improve, right? And so if you're unable to see the benefit of growing in your fitness or in your finances or in your social charisma or in the way that you dress, then you're not gonna be able to make as much headway in your overall improvement as you actually want to. And so the fact that you guys have been so warm and so open to the other ideas that the other speakers have presented and that you've been so engaged in conversations with me, I can see a lot of potential in you guys to be able to make the kind of progress that you're actually after. Now, one of the things that makes this presentation a little bit more different than what you may or may not have been exposed to when it comes to the ideas of style and clothing and the way that we dress is I'm not here to give you guys a prescriptive formula. I'm not gonna tell you the five shoes that you need to own this fall or the top 20 bow ties that you should have in your wardrobe or anything else like that. And honestly, that's one of the big problems when it comes to the world of men's style and men's appearance. And we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper as we get into the talk about the difference between external and internal manifestations of who each of you are as men and how your style can help improve on that. But we have to take it back a few steps before we even can get to that level of the conversation. And so before we even do, we gotta go to the very basic, which is why are you here? And I don't mean like, why are you here on earth? Even though there's a part of that, like what is your purpose? But why are you guys here? Why are you here today? You've spent good money, you've taken time, you're here, a lot of you guys, this is your very first time and it's a totally foreign and alien environment. Why are you here? And the main reason that you are here is because you don't want to be average, right? Average is the enemy. Mediocracy is the enemy. Complacency is the enemy. We want nothing to do with that, especially because as technology improves, as standards of living improve, masculinity and the definition of average when it comes to masculinity continues to decline so frustrating about the state of the world that we're in is we as average or slightly above or even well above average men in a lot of regards even 50 years ago would have been below average that standard of masculinity continues to decline now what's great about that for us is that subjective right I don't have to compare myself to or compete against the men of a hundred years ago and neither do you so as that standard continues to decline it becomes even easier to rise above and to no longer be average, right? So that should be encouraging. We should be able to take heart from that. But average is the enemy. Mediocrity is the enemy. We're here to kill that complacency and to become even better than that. This is average when it comes to appearance, right? This is what average looks like. And there's a story about mediocrity and average that we tell with our clothing. What all of this says, now yeah, you could set Bruce Campbell aside, especially in burn notice, right? But what all of this says is I don't care that my top priority in life is feeling comfortable. Now, I don't know at any other point in, in any society, 
any civilization in history and anywhere in the world where masculinity was defined by the pursuit of comfort. I, nothing. Men have never been defined by our desire to be comfortable. Why in the world do we think that the only masculine approach to clothing is, it's gotta be comfortable. It's totally antithetical to what our MO as men is and what our MO as men should be. Now that's not to say comfort is not a good thing, but if comfort is your God, if you worship at the altar of comfort every single day, you will never be better than average. And if one of your rituals of worship to the God of comfort every day is putting on average clothing, you're worshiping that God. You will never be better than average. If this is the story that you tell yourself every single day, you will never be better than average. Now it's just clothing, it's just what we put on our body, but it's obviously so much more than just clothing because it tells a story. And it doesn't just tell a story to the rest of the world, but it tells a story to us. Every time you see yourself in the mirror, you're being told a story. Every time you catch your reflection in the window of the subway or in the window of a car, you're being told a story. And I want that story to not be the story of average, right? So the question then becomes, why don't we dress better? Why is the inertia of society one in which we don't want to dress better? And it's not that we are indifferent, which is what the major answer is. You ask a guy, well, why don't you dress better? I don't care, right? But our identity is wrapped up in this apparent indifference. It's not really indifference at all. Indifference is a mask for the real reason we don't dress better, and that's because it's fear. Now, I know that that can sound a little bit weird, because if you were to out and out ask somebody, are you scared of dressing well? No, it's ridiculous. Why would I be afraid of dressing well? But again, it's not just about putting on clothing. It's about everything that comes with that. All the pros, all the cons, all the risks, all the rewards, all the potential baggage, all the potential opportunities, all these things that can come with dressing better, and that's what we are afraid of. Especially because, well, let me show you what I mean by that. This is an interesting way to be able to see and understand this, but this should be able to demonstrate this very well. You have negative and positive and attention and no attention. So you can get really negative attention or you can get really positive attention or you can just have not people pay attention to you at all. Now when it comes to dressing differently from average, when you're trying to get attention, when you're trying to not fit in, you can be over here in the negative or in the positive side. Now I'm not gonna put anybody specifically on black because you're all here to try to improve, but I know that you guys, as you've been here, as you've assessed each other, as you've assessed the speakers, you've been able to see other men who are here and they definitely don't dress down here, they stand out, but they don't necessarily stand out in a good way, right? That's one of the risks, is some of us here have been wearing clothing that doesn't work and it's risky because not only are you getting attention and there's the pressure that comes from that, but it's negative attention. You look like an idiot. I'm not saying anybody here looks like an idiot, but that's a lot of times what happens. And it's so much easier and safer to stay right down here where people don't pay attention to us at all, where we fit in, where there aren't any expectations of us, where we're consistent. Because here's the thing that makes this even more challenging and even more difficult, is if you're dressing in a way that you execute well, you're demonstrating mastery, you've got a skill set, you look good, it still can get you negative attention. If you've got friends or family who resent you because you dress better, that's negative attention and that sucks. It's a crabs in the bucket mentality, but it's still real and you still have to deal with it. Or you can get cognitive dissonance because you dress and tell the world the story that you're here. You're a man who takes care of business. You're a man who pays attention to the details. You're a man who's shaping his own world and his image but if your actions aren't congruent with that, if they're not consistent with that, if you're not being authentic in those pursuits like Hunter was talking about yesterday, then all of a sudden all that potential for positive attention turns into negative because you're a poser and you're a fake and you're a phony. And we as men do not want that. We as people do not want that. Dr. Cialdini in his book Influence, he talks about the consistency principle, about how we are hardwired to want to see ourselves as consistent. 
And if we are not, then not only do we start to self-implode, but the way that other people start to treat us becomes more and more negative. And so obviously it is so much easier to stay down here, right? So much more comfortable to stay down here. But again, what's the MO of masculinity? It's not comfort, it's not ease, it's purpose, it's direction, it's accomplishment. And yes, you can accomplish things even if you don't dress well, but it's so much harder. And you can think about guys like Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs or other men who have been able to do things in spite of dressing poorly, but that didn't make their lives any easier. It didn't make their job any easier. It doesn't make the continuation of that job any easier. You look at Zuckerberg and what he's doing now is he's getting ready to run for president, which is basically what he's doing. And he's changing his appearance because he could wear scrubs. He could wear gray t-shirts and crappy Adidas sandals and still write the code and come up with Facebook. There was no correlation there. But when it comes to having influence beyond creating Facebook, being able to do more and bigger and better things than that, he understands, or at least his team around him understands, that he has to dress differently because it makes that influence easier for him to accomplish. So we know that this is where fear and mediocrity and everything else lives. We know that we avoid or we want to avoid the risk of ending up over here, and as a result, we often end up avoiding going over here. But this is where we want to be. And I don't mean that you have to stand out and get a ton of attention, but you want to be memorable, and you want to see yourself as a man who is memorable. You want to see yourself every day as someone who's better than average, as someone who doesn't worship at the altar of average or comfort. Because ultimately, this is what this is. You guys remember what Joe was talking about the other day. Average clothing is a big old self-hug. It's just one way for us to comfort ourselves and make ourselves feel really good that the big bad world isn't gonna hurt us that much because my clothes are comfortable. And that's not what we do as men. There's nothing wrong with a temporary self-hug when things are getting hard. You should not wear a self-hug every day. You do not need to wear one all day long, every single day. Use it as a tool, but do not make the aesthetic self-hug your default. It should only be used when it's appropriate. I mean, you don't walk around like this all day, right? We would feel ridiculous and people would treat us differently and no man of dignity or respect is gonna walk around like this all day. So why in the world would we do the aesthetic equivalent of that to ourselves each and every day? So the problem of going beyond that, of understanding that all of a sudden, yes, we do need to dress better. We need to dress in a way that's appropriate. It's a way that signals discipline and dominance and power and authority is that everybody just goes to this. Everybody just goes to seeing and they think that it is a one size fits all approach to do this. And this is another area in which I've been very pleased at this conference because one of the things as I speak at different conferences, especially those that are geared more towards men who are already interested in men's style, is you see this costume all the time. And don't kid yourselves that this is not a costume, it is. This is gentleman cosplay. This is dressing up as a gentleman and thinking that by donning this costume on, I will have the authority and the respect and the gravitas and the power of what was traditionally a gentleman. But this doesn't grant you any more power than throwing on Spider-Man's suit can make you sling webs. It doesn't. This worked at, at these points in time. This worked in the 40s and the 50s, not because the clothing was inherently powerful, but because of what the world was like at that time and the way that things were communicated at that time. But we live in a world that teaches us, okay, I understand I don't want to dress poorly, I don't want to be average, and the only answer is to do the gentleman's cosplay. This is this false binary that we live in. It's this or this. And it doesn't work like that. Clothing does not work like that. There is not a single prescription that applies to everybody. Now in order to understand that, you need to be able to understand that clothing is communication. It has aesthetic value on its own. We'll talk about that a little bit in a second. But clothing is communication. It's the ability to tell a story to the world quickly and effectively, or at least if you're doing it right, you're doing it effectively, in a way that either will support and buoy up who you actually can and is consistent and congruent with the actual things that you say and the way that you say them, or it will negate and undermine those things. But either way, you are always communicating with your clothing. 
Now, one of the things that's so interesting about this is as soon as we understand that clothing is communication, then it becomes a lot easier to understand why this default of you should always be doing suiting is, it, it's a false narrative. So look at this idea of truncated, quick communication, okay? We understand what this means, and there are people in the world who will lament the truncation of language, what's being communicated here, but this means something to us. Okay, but if you don't necessarily subscribe to this type of language, you don't like that it's quick, you don't like that it's pithy, you don't like anything like that, that doesn't mean that you go in this direction. You do not overcompensate. This is overcompensation and it's so easy to see that when it comes to the words that we speak. It's so easy to see that. If you're gonna make the world a better place, you're not gonna do it by speaking Shakespearean English. Are you? Of course not. You understand that that kind of thing is going to separate you. That's going to put you up in that negative attention quadrant. And none of us here, whether it's the speakers or anybody else, has the clout or the gravitas to be able to say, I'm going to bring back Shakespearean English. We can't. We don't have the status. We don't have the authority. We don't have the ability to do that. Maybe within this one particular tribe, but then that lessens the effectiveness of this one particular tribe on the rest of the world in general. So obviously, it's very easy to see when we do this but this is the aesthetic equivalent of that. Now, I'm not saying that there are not times or places in, when it's in which it is appropriate to do that. There are plenty of times in which it's appropriate to quote Shakespeare. There are plenty of times in which it's appropriate to be able to use better English, but you don't want to be pedantic. And just like you don't want to be pedantic in your language, you don't want to become pedantic in your clothing. Okay? So we know what average looks like. We know that going to suiting is not the only alternative. So then how do you actually do this is the real question. How do you actually develop a sense of style that works for you if it's not one of these two options? We're gonna skip through those real quick and go into this. So there's six different things to factor in, all right? Now the very first one is important and it's also where everybody else stops and it's your body. And you need to understand that the way you're built your proportions, your coloring, the contrast between your hair and your skin, all these other variables, they matter. And I know that as we talk about that, it can kind of feel a little bit overwhelming. We're like, oh, uh, uh, you telling me like I gotta learn about coloring? And I gotta figure out like, do I wear warm tones or cool tones? Or do I like, I can't wear these shapes or these patterns? I don't wanna think about that. And again, are you worshiping at the altar of comfort? But then what's interesting is as you learn those principles, it actually makes your life a lot easier. I can go in and I can go to a store, I can shop online, and I can immediately eliminate 99% of the things that are in there because I know what works for my body and what doesn't. My opportunity cost is so much lower. My decision fatigue is basically non-existent when it comes to actually finding clothing that works for me because I understand what does and doesn't work for me. So rather than having to stew and sift and figure out does this work or does this not? By learning that knowledge and then being able to apply it to yourself, you're actually able to generate the right kind of clothing for you. Now this idea of things working within your body, this is traditional. You guys have all seen the Vitruvian Man. This was something that was created by Da Vinci as he was trying to demonstrate within the human body the concept of phi, or phi as some other people pronounce it. And it's basically the idea of proportions. And the way that it works is it's understanding that everything when it comes to ideal and aesthetic beauty actually works within nature within a specific set of proportions. And if your body or different, like the length of your fingers or the ratio between your eyes and your lips is a little bit disproportionate, then that's what takes people away from the perfect standard of beauty. Now what I'm not recommending you do is figure out how this principle of phi or this Vitruvian principle of proportionality completely and totally affects you, where it's like, okay, well, my lips are a little bit off, so I, like, I gotta wear makeup, or like, I gotta get you know, surgery to extend those out. Like, we're not after that, that level of perfection, okay? Because then all of a sudden the risks and the rewards, like it's not worth it. But what you do wanna start to do is actually understand what it is about your body that works and what it is about your body that doesn't. Now I've got gorilla arms, okay? My arms are disproportionately long for the rest of my body. I've dealt with that frustration as I've shopped for clothing online. I've dealt with that frustration even as I found clothing that fits 
and trying to be able to understand how it can make everything look good. But once I was able to figure out how to make that work for me, and I was able to figure out how to use other components of my clothing to be able to visually offset that, then again, it becomes it's significantly easier to be able to dress well, and I continue to reap the rewards and the benefits that come from that. So let me show you an example of what kind of the difference between good proportions and bad proportions look like. And before I say anything, I, I do not think that Donald Trump is well dressed. I don't think anybody does that. Like we can MAGA all day long, but I don't think anybody's gonna argue that Donald Trump is well dressed, okay? But the problem is, is GQ doesn't make him well dressed either, okay? Now GQ, they have their own prescriptive idea of what good style is, and this is a good demonstration of why that prescriptive or like pun intended one size fits all approach doesn't actually work. So let's talk about his tie. Here, he's wearing something that's actually proportionate. He's a big guy, okay? He's a big guy, he's got a broad face, he's got big hair, and so this, the tie, the lapels, everything else, they actually fit his proportions. Ignore how baggy the suit is and all that, but GQ, because, oh, skinny lapels and skinny ties and tie clips, they put him in something like this, and it actually makes his head look fatter. It makes his face look rounder, it makes his shoulders look too scrawny, and it makes his chest look disproportioned. Now, GQ, you could argue, is doing that because they're actually trying to undermine him, but this does not make him look better. This is bad, but this is actually worse because the proportions aren't there. And so being able to know what works within your body. I was talking to Taylor back here for a minute, and he's a, he's a thin guy. And so Taylor, you would look good in something like this because you've got those proportions. Other guys would look better in something like this because of what your proportions are. And again, the idea of understanding that decision fatigue is minimized because you know this information it will make your lives easier and it will free you up to reap the rewards of understanding how to dress well while still putting more mental energy into something else. Okay, so you know how to work with your body. We know that body is important, but that's not the end all be all of all of this. There's more to it than just that. The next step up is to understand your archetype. You guys know what an archetype is. It's basically a canonization or like a broad generalization of what an ideal is, okay? And when it comes to style, you've got three basic archetypes. You've got rugged, refined, and rakish. Now the way that these work is they're dependent on the way that you interact with the world around you. And what's really fun about this is you're not all one type or the other. Now look at this guy, Jack Donovan, right here, okay? He's speaking to us tomorrow. I had a great time getting to talk with him last night. Jack epitomizes the rugged archetype. He does things with his hands. He lifts heavy weights. He builds buildings, like he homesteads. He does stuff physically. He exists in a physical world. Tell me that he does not care about his style. You don't look like this on Occident. That is not average. Right? Jack absolutely cares. Each one of those patches, it means something. That cut that he's wearing on, he had to earn that. He had to go through initiation rites and go through other things in order to actually be able to earn the right to wear that and represent the group that that belongs to. That is style, but it's not suiting. And if you were to see Jack up here presenting tomorrow in a suit, talk about incongruence and inauth inauthenticity because that's not the story of who he is. This is my buddy Derek. He runs a company that I used to work for called Beckett and Rob. And these men very much fit within the refined archetype. Now, if you fall within the refined, basically, rather than dealing with the world physically, you are someone who fits within the world within social networks or finances or traditions. You're a rule follower. You like traditionalism. This is, this is my primary archetype. I'm more refined than anything else. I, I like rules. I like structure. I like civilization. I like those things. And this is a demonstration of status and accomplishment and all these other things that come through that. And now, in the 21st century, as it's been for the last 100 years within the West, this is typified by a suit. Doesn't mean it always will be. Doesn't mean it always was. You look at people like George Washington. He was refined. He would not be wearing something like this, right? Those archetypes can continue throughout different cultures. Genghis Khan, you know, like still cared about what he wore, in fact, one of the things that's interesting about Khan is that as he became a bigger conqueror, he and his people stopped wearing coats made out of the skins of feed mice 
and actually started embracing some of the gold and silver and these other things, these foam robes of these civilizations that we conquered. And there was a schism that came from that because it was a way for them to demonstrate that they were getting soft and they were losing their barbarian virtues all over things like clothing and, and status displays. And then over here we've got Kanye West's the personification of the rakish archetype. Now, if you fit within the rakish archetype, the way that you primarily interact with the world is by giving it the middle finger. You don't like to follow the rules. You're a rebel. You like to be an iconoclast. You like to go against the grain. And so one of the ways that you can leverage that is by dressing in a way that polarizes. A lot of people do not like the way that Kanye West dress. But whether you like it or not, the man is a kingmaker. He can wear a pair of shoes to an event and all of a sudden they are completely off the shelves for weeks and then they're being resold on market. I mean, his Yeezy line that he sells with, uh, with Adidas, they sell for about 350 bucks and whenever they do a new drop, they sell out within a matter of seconds and then you have to rebuy them from resellers for thousands of dollars on these different markets just because he's been able to build that hype and he does that because he's such a rebel. Now what works for you guys is that you're not all one of any of these. We all have components. So I'm primarily ra uh, refined with a little bit of rakish and then a small dose of rugged within there. And each one of you guys has some component of that to you as well. If you want to know what your primary archetype is, go take this quiz that I've got on my site. It's like seven or eight questions long. And as you take that, it'll spit out an answer for you. And it'll give you your primary one so that you can use that as a way to start to understand the direction in which you should be headed. Because I'm going to go back to this idea back here. As we talked about clothing being communication, I want you to think about your archetype as a language. Okay? You cannot just say whatever gibberish comes out of your mouth. In order for us to be able to understand each other, I have to be able to speak English. You have to be able to understand English, right? If it were some other language than that. And your archetype is your language, OK? Now, I can blend in a je ne sais quoi. You know, you can put in some French or je ne sais, like with a little bit of Spanish. You can blend in different components of different archetypes, just like you can blend in different components of different languages. But if clothing is communication, your archetype is the main language. But as we dive in deeper, down to the next component, which is tribe, then we can get even a little bit more specific. You guys seen a map like this before? This is kind of interesting because different parts of the country will refer to carbonated drinks differently. We all speak English, we all speak the same language, we're all part of the same quote unquote archetype, but just based on where we are and the people with whom we associate ourselves, we speak the language just a little bit differently. And if you were to, in fact, okay, so I live right here in Salt Lake City, and I say soda rather than pop, and that's a weird thing, and I still get weird looks from people as a result. I can leverage that to my advantage, or I can have it be to my disadvantage, but I have to understand that that works there, and the same thing happens aesthetically with our clothing. So you work within your archetype, and then you start to go a little bit deeper, and you start to understand how those archetypes are manifested in different tribes. Now here's a good example of different tribes that fit within the same archetype. All four of these men, rugged, right? Not hard to argue that. But you've got an operator, a mountain man, a cowboy, and a survivalist. These guys are probably not all going to see each other as kindred spirit. They're not going to see each other as brothers. There's probably not going to be any animosity. But they're not going to look at each other and it's like, oh yeah, we're all part of the rugged archetype. Let's be bros. Like, it's got to be deeper than that. And so, yes, there are similarities. There are more things that are similar about them than different when it comes to that archetypal ratio. But their tribes are still very unique and very different. And look at how different they're dressed. Okay? They all fit within that same archetype. But in order to be able to fit within and thrive within their different tribes, they dress differently from each other. And they dress congruently and consistently with what their tribes actually are. A good way to see this in our own kind of culture is within the gym, okay? Because if you want to see different tribes, the gym is a great place to go. Now look at this, we've got the CrossFit tribe, and you can compare that to the powerlifting tribe, and then you can compare that to the bodybuilding tribe, okay? These are all three big names within their respective tribes, and they all are doing the same exercise, they're all doing a front squat, but look at how Steve Cook is dressed compared to Duffin, compared to Froning. They're all doing the same thing. They're all exercising, but they're all dressed a little bit differently. 
Because these little distinctions in the way that they dress really helps them in their lives. It helps them feel like they're part of this group. The group recognize that they are leaders within that group. It benefits them. And you can walk into a CrossFit gym, a, a CrossFit gym and if you're dressed like a power lifter, you're going to be treated differently. We can whine about that. We can say that's not fair. We can say that's shallow. We can say it's stupid. It doesn't change anything. You walk into a power lifter dressed like a CrossFitter, and you will be treated differently. And so much of that is just signaled through the clothing that we decide to wear. So understand who your tribes are. Understand the way that clothing affects and is affected by the tribes that you belong to, and understand how you can use your clothing to improve your mission within the different teams that you to. Okay, from there, we go up to the next level, which is taste. Because obviously we are not just a product of the men and women with whom we interact. There's more to us than just our tribes. There's way more to us than just whether or not we fit in with or stand, stand apart from a different group. This is where taste comes in. You have to be able to tell your unique and interesting story about who you are, what you want from the world, and what it is that you offer to the world. Let me show you an example of what too much tribe and not enough person looks like. Right here. That is a uniform right there, okay? And all these girls who are wearing their olive field jackets with their skinny jeans and their knee-high brown boots probably all have Twitter handles that say I'm different or I'm unique or I'm a snowflake or whatever else, <laughs> right? But they're all dressed so similarly. Now what's so interesting about this idea of taste is that there's a component of it that works ex-tribe and there's a component of it that works in tribe Because take this example of suiting. This is the, some of the guys of the Beckett and Rob team that I used to be a part of. Now if you don't belong to the tribe that, that I belong to as far as like sartorialism and suiting and menswear, all of these would look very, very similar. And you, would, and you would be able to look at it and go, well, this is, these, they're both uniforms, right? There's no difference. There's no distinction. And if you are not part of that tribe, you're right. There's not really a whole lot of distinction. But when you get into one, then there's very little subtle details that are ways to be able to distinguish, to distinguish yourself. And what you need to be able to understand is sometimes you're better off drawing your personal taste and, and creating personal taste by combining a bunch of different tribes and creating a look that's completely unique and completely different, sometimes you're better off by staying 99% tribe and just doing a little tweak on taste. So like for example, I'm wearing a wool knit tie and I tie a double four in hand knot. My buddy Jesse here, he prefers a single four in hand. Dustin over here, he's like a classic Windsor guy and his collar spread is a little bit different than mine. Mine's really wide, Derek likes his really wide. These are really subtle things that you guys don't matter, right? And you don't have to worry about them to that extent. But these little things between us are ways for us to signal to each other and to ourselves that we fit in a little bit differently, that we see ourselves a little bit differently, that we tell our stories a little bit uniquely compared to each other. And so again, there's not a right or a wrong as far as do you see this as a uniform or do you see this as a manifestation of personal taste? What the onus on you is, is to be able to understand, do I really stand out? Do I really go with personal taste? Or do I just do it a little bit? What are the costs? What are the benefits of going in either direction? And then after assessing that, you make a decision and you use it to your advantage. Because if it is to your advantage to really stand out and really separate yourself, you have no business doing it subtly. But if you're gonna miss out on opportunities that would come from being able to stand out in a subtle way because you just have it in your head that I gotta really stand out, I gotta peacock or whatever else, then you're missing out on opportunities there. So know what's going to benefit you the best and make your decisions accordingly. After that, we factor in things like location, okay? And going back to this idea of clothing being communication, you guys know Tenacious D, right? Not exactly the most like family friendly, kid friendly guys, right? They're crass, they're entertaining, they're funny. But you take somebody like Jack Black and you put him on a show like Yo Gabba Gabba, his language changes, doesn't it? 
They wouldn't let him on the show if his language didn't change, if his jokes didn't change, if the actual words he used didn't change. Now, does that make him a sellout? Is he inconsistent or incongruent because he uses different language on a kid's show than he does on his music videos? Of course not. Are you a sellout if you speak with different volume in your voice in a library than you do at a concert? Of course not. When it, comes to, when it comes to language and speaking, we understand that the location or the environment in which we find ourselves matters and that we can adjust and adapt without fully and fundamentally changing our story. His humor is still the same. He's still bombastic. He's still a little bit weird and crazy, but he just does it to different degrees and it manifests itself in different ways within the band as it does on a kid's show. That's the same thing with your clothing. You're not gonna wear a suit, even if you're a suit guy, when you go to the gym. You better not. You're not gonna wear, and that's really easy to see, but then you look at stuff like flip-flops and shorts, and it's like, well, I'll just wear that unless it's a funeral. I'm just gonna wear flip-flops and shorts. Why? Because it's comfortable. And what it demonstrates is a lack of the ability to actually understand the social situations in which you find yourselves and the ability to navigate that. And you can do it on a macro scale, because obviously the function of your clothing is dependent on the environment. This is what my house looks like right now. We, started, we got snow a week ago up in the mountains. It was like 40 degrees when we flew out. Jacket weather, the flannels and tweeds are coming out, like it's different. This is, I mean, this is Miami, but it's basically the same here. All of a sudden we're in 90 plus degrees, tons of humidity. I'm not wearing tops and scarves and cashmere here. Not at all. I'm wearing stuff that breathes, I'm wearing stuff that's light. I'm certainly, even when we go out to Socrates' place tonight, I made the mistake last year of wearing one of my sport coats, and it was miserable because it's so stupid hot in this state. And so I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that tonight. You know, I'm gonna dress down, I'm gonna be able to understand the environment of both socially what's going on at the event, but then also functionally what my clothing needs to do for me. So we understand it on a macro scale, but then it exists even on a micro scale. And then the, the sixth and final component is your effort. So you've done body, archetype, tribe, taste, location, and that last little piece, the top of the pyramid, is effort. Any Suits fans in here? Any of you guys watch this show? Harvey Specter is a really compelling character, and he's a smooth talker. He's always saying the right words. He can talk circles around his guys. He's an attorney, and he's one of the best in New York. From his perspective, he's the best in New York, right? Um, but he can... He always knows the right thing to say, and he can always do it incredibly well and incredibly effectively. He's a talker. He uses a lot of words, and it's not always you know, fitting within the stereotype of, of, uh, of attorneys. A lot of times, he's using a lot of words to not say a whole lot. Now, you contrast that with another fictional character, Don Draper. He doesn't say much of anything. Very stoic, very reserved. Now, if you watch both of these shows, you'll be able to understand that Yes, their presence and their authority and their toss are different. They're different in manifestations, but they're equal in strength and equal in value. If you're somebody who really likes to talk and you like to put out big ideas, look at Rolo. Rolo uses big words and he uses a lot of them. And he's good at it. And that's one of the ways that Rolo communicates. And you take other guys who can say, similar things and they can do it in 140 characters on Twitter in one tweet rather than having to string together a thread. And neither one is better or worse than the other. So when it comes to our language, we can understand that effort matters. And the same thing happens with your clothing. Because what I'm not telling you is that you have to have a big wardrobe. I'm not telling you that you need a ton of clothing. You can go minimalistic. A lot of guys really thrive off of the idea of a minimalistic wardrobe. It frees you up from the mental energy of having to think every day about what you're wearing. It frees you up to be able to not worry about, like, am I mixing this pattern with that pattern? And how do I demonstrate mastery this way or that way? None of that really matters because it's all pre-thought out. There's a lot of effort. I will tell you guys right now that creating an effective wardrobe that's this small, the upfront investment and effort is way bigger than it is to put in to a wardrobe like this. It's a lot harder to curate a small but effective wardrobe than it is to just get a big and a full one. But again, Clothing, it doesn't matter. It's just whatever works best for you. Clothing is amoral. There's not a right or a wrong when it comes to little wardrobe, minimalistic versus big one. It's whatever is going to benefit you, your situation, and your life the most.
It's whatever is going to be able to help you provide the most opportunities. It's what's going to help you overcome mediocrity and being average the most. And so whether that's big or little, that doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it just needs to be what's best for you. So those are your six. Body, archetype, tribe, taste, location, and effort. If you want to make it easier, you can just think of it as a battle plan, B-A-T-T-L-E, okay? Now, all of this is a long, very effort-filled way to be able to hit home one very important concept that I want to talk to you about before we close up. It's the idea that fashion is a four-letter word. Men have no business caring about fashion. And the reason why is because fashion is determined by other people. Fashion is some designer in New York somewhere or some 22-year-old chick who works at 4Club or 5-4Club or whatever that's, you know, subscription boxes are called, telling you that this is what you should be wearing. Fashion is you being defined by your cat. Fashion is not what we're after here. What we're after is style. Style is the exact opposite. It's being able to take who you are internally, being able to take your understanding of your position within the world, being able to take all of that and then tell that story to the rest of the world through your appearance. It's being able to take an internal manifestation or an internal component, an internal story, and then demonstrating that externally, as opposed to fashion being the outside world giving me my value internally. Clothes do not make the man. They don't. That's why one of the biggest problems that most men, most of my clients when I bring guys on to work with one-on-one, -on -one, one of the biggest things that they struggle with is one, feeling a lack of direction, and that's because they don't use this system of those six steps, but then two, they'll say that they don't feel like themselves. They don't feel authentic. You guys ever felt that way? Show of hands. You don't like dressing better because you feel like it's not me, right? Like, yeah, that's weird. And the reason why most of us experience that is because we're letting somebody else determine what clothing we should be putting on our bodies as opposed to actively and proactively choosing how we're going to manifest who we are through an external factor or through an external force. And so if you can just flip that script inside your own head. If you can take a proactive, I'm going to develop a sense of style, I'm going to leverage that style so that I can get along better with other people, I can see myself as a man who's not average, I can use it to help making the accomplishment of other much more important goals a lot easier because don't get me wrong, you guys, your style, tertiary, maybe secondary when it comes to importance, but it should not be your primary goal. But the benefit of it is it makes the accomplishment of your primary goal much easier. And so if you can learn how to flip that script, you can learn how to take what you are internally as a man and use that in your style as opposed to bringing it in from somebody else who says this is what's in this season. That's where true style comes from. Now I'll tell you one more thing that really helps bring it around to authenticity. <coughs> And especially because it works with this, this idea or this design of not being average or not doing the self-hug. You don't want to be authentic to who you are now. You want to be authentic to the best version of yourself. That's the way that you want to dress, is in congruence with the best version of yourself. If you can learn who that man is, if you can envision what that man looks like, then by dressing in a way that's congruent with that, you'll be better dressed than you are now, and it will help you get to become that man. Now, if he's like nine or 10 steps ahead of where you are right now, maybe you don't dress that way. I was working with one of my clients who's based out in LA, and he, like almost 100% fit within that refined archetype. And for him, the ideal is to be able to like, be part of an equestrian club and wear like, Dinner, dinner jackets and wear all these different things. Like for him, that's, that's the ideal version. And he's not anywhere near that. And so in order for him to start to get there, it doesn't quite work. Like he can't just go out and buy awesome custom dinner jackets and wear those into his tech job, okay? But he can start to improve towards that. Think about it back to this concept of like in the gym and those different tribes. Think about it like weightlifting. If my goal is a 500 pound deadlift, I'm not going to go put 500 pounds on the bar tomorrow. I can't. Like, it's just, it's not going to work.
But if I can do a one rep max at 315, and then I do some accessory work, and then I push myself, and maybe in a couple weeks I can get 320, and then I work within the, con the concept of progressive overload with my weights, then eventually I can get up to that 500 pounds. And so use that idea of progressive overload. Now what's nice for a lot of you guys, some of you guys I can already tell you dress intentionally, so you may just be making incremental changes. You may only add the aesthetic equivalent of five more pounds onto your deadlift over a six month period. But a lot of you guys are gonna get the benefit of the newbie gains. You're gonna be able to go through and make a lot of changes really quickly and feel more authentic and look better and have people treat you better and have it be easier for you to make other more important changes in your life more quickly because you've got more progress to make. You've got more room to be able to stretch within. Now, if you guys wanna to talk to me about this, I'm here for the rest of the conference and I know that a lot of this stuff, like it's good from 50,000 feet up, but if you wanna talk about how this actually applies to you, come and talk to me. I love talking about this stuff with you guys. I love being able to see how this works and how these manifestations can happen for you. So do not hesitate to come and I will give you as much time as I possibly can. If you wanna see some of my other stuff, you can follow me on Instagram or at Twitter, it's at Tanner Guzzi. Um, you can check out my YouTube channel wherein I talk about all this stuff. It's uh, masculine style or you can visit the main site. But really, just come and spend your time and talk to me. I'm happy to dive in on not just the concepts, but how those specifically apply to you and we can get you guys taken care of. So I've got about 13 minutes left, which is a little bit less than I usually like to leave, um, but I've got about 13 minutes left to do some Q&A. So let's, uh, let's see if I can answer some questions for you guys. All right, back here. Hi, Tanner, uh, thanks for the talk. So my question is, what if your location works against your archetype? Elaborate on that for me. So, okay, let's give my personal example. I work in a biology lab, right? And I find myself, uh, you know, ideally more in the refined category. And then def definitely, those are some things that I find really hard to just put, put together. If I wear refined, say, clothes, you know, going into a lab doing experiment, or I might spill chemicals on my clothes. You know, the, the animal might bite, like the animal might poop on my clothes, and mm -hmm. then this, you know, like just it's really hard to work. So in that case, and then most of the days, you know, as us, like we go to work, and then you ideally for you know whatever you spend most of your time on, you want to be you know whatever you like yourself to be. Right. Okay. So how just to make sure I understand correctly, you work in a lab, you're worried about the actual like function of your clothing because you don't want to spill chemicals or have animals or anything else like that on it, but you still want it to be able to fit within your archetype, which is more refined. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Do you have a uniform at work? Like do you wear scrubs or? Uh, no. Well, I mean, sometimes only when you do certain things, but okay. not all the time. Okay. So there's still what, thank you. That's a great question. Um, there's still ways to be able to do that because find archetype, there's a lot of times where people get in a hang up, and I'm not necessarily saying that this is where you are, but a lot of times people think that refined means formal. It means that, okay, well, I'm not going to wear it to the lab, obviously, right? But if you do things like, okay, maybe you're wearing polo shirts, and maybe you just upgrade to wearing a button-up shirt, and it doesn't have to be a nice one because you know that stuff is going to happen to it. You go to H&M and you buy $5 button-up shirts because you know that they're going to be garbage and it doesn't matter but it's a way to dress up and to see yourself as, I am always a refined man, regardless of the environment in which I find myself. Maybe you tuck in your shirt. Maybe you wear better shoes. Maybe you just buy higher quality or you use more color, colors that are more simple, or you just make sure that it fits you better, but it's being able to take something beyond just refined is this particular piece of clothing and taking the concepts of discipline, um, industriousness, uh, execution and those things that are kind of represented by that refined archetype and being able to apply those same principles within whatever your clothing limitations actually are. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. We got one back here. Hey, uh, Tanner. It appears that like the rakish archetype would generate a lot of negative attention or positive attention because it's uh, very polarizing. So could you elaborate more on rakish versus just so much negative attention that it's terrible? Yes, thank you. That is, uh, that's a fun question because 
especially as you look at like the pickup community and it's not it's not prevalent now but you look at the old stuff like mystery and they're talking about peacocking and this idea of like really dressing in a way that stands out and the problem that most guys deal with when it comes to the rakish archetype is that they think that it's the easy one to be able to to lean into and it's not it's the most difficult because if you're not actually a rebel if you're not actually comfortable being the guy who's standing in the middle of the room with everybody looking at you and half of them wanting to be like you and having them want to beat the crap out of you, then you're inconsistent, you're incongruent. And so the more you can just get doses of that rakish archetype into, who you, into the way that you dress, then the better it's gonna be for most guys. Now, if you lean fully that way and if you're comfortable being in that kind of spotlight, rock and roll with it. But even something as little as like, I've got a big window pane check on my jacket, okay? I'm still wearing a sport coat. I'm still wearing something that for most men would be considered to be part of that refined archetype. But the fact that it's got the window pane, I've got on blue loafers without any socks, like those are micro doses of rakishness that still tells that overall consistent story of refined with some rakish in there, but it doesn't make it so that if, so ever I, I, I don't feel uncomfortable or I don't feel like, Half the guys in here hate me. And then the other thing that you need to think about, this is obviously related to more than just clothing, but we too easily and too readily give away the ability for other people to affect us. Like I like you guys and I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of you guys, but there are very few of you in this room who have yet to earn, you, you have yet earned the right for your opinion to matter to me. You haven't earned that right yet. You've earned it more now by being here and spending this time with me than you would have a week ago before I knew who any of you were. If I had seen you guys in the airport before we got here and I did not know that you were 21 con attendees, I would not care what you thought of me. You hadn't earned that right. You've earned it a little bit more now. My wife back here, she's taking photos of me. She's earned that right more than you guys have. Goldman, we've known each other for a few years. He's earned that right more than you guys have. And so it's being able to factor in, do the right people hate me? That's a good thing and being able to be comfortable with that as opposed to, oh crap, like what if people don't like what I'm wearing? Does that make sense? Cool, okay, right back here. Yeah. So, you can hold the mic. Um, I got a question between uh, authentic individuality mm -hmm. versus balancing that with fashion of what's currently considered fashionable. Uh, so an example right now is the beard and the hipster look. Okay. So a lot of guys here wearing beards. Uh, and the question is then is how much of that is between um, you're wearing having a beard and a hipster look because fashion right now suggests you should wear that as opposed to you wearing it because you feel that that's what makes you authentic as an individual and still going to give you a positive uh, impression as opposed to negative impression. So how do you balance that between being authentic um, but making a positive impact but at the same time maybe not necessarily following fashion because that might make you feel a little bit inauthentic, being, being more yourself. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's the balance between tribe and taste and then knowing if I lean too far one way, then there's, there are opportunities or costs versus leaning too far the other way, there are opportunities or costs, right? And I certainly understand that because one of the things that we as men do not want to be is trendy. Like no man has any business being cute or trendy. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't behoove us. There's no dignity in that. And unless you're at the top of the, you know, the top of the food chain and you're the one who's dictating what those trends are, being trendy for the most part is not to our advantage. So I understand the reticence to lean that way. But at the same time, if you really are more benefited by wearing a beard, like I've got a weak jaw. I wish that I had a better jawline, but I don't. I look like a 12 year old girl without a beard. <laughs> and so I've had some semblance of a beard for the last like nine years, which means like the first three or four years that I was it was not popular. I got grief for it at work. I worked at a credit union and there was all these, this kind of misconceptions about it and everything. And so there were costs that came from that. But what you do is you just have to look at, okay, here are all the, here are all the pros of wearing it when it comes to like my individual taste and my authenticity. And here are all the cons. And then the same thing with pros and cons when it comes to weighing that out against other people and, and their expectations. And then whatever the balance between those two is, go with it. So if you feel so inauthentic by not choosing to wear a beard, 
that it overrides all the potential benefits that come from people embracing beauty and the fact that it actually looks good on you and the fact that it works within your tribe and all these different contexts, but you can't do it and that's more important, do not grow a beard. But at the same time, if it's only just annoying that like beards are trendy and you get the occasional like, oh, you're such a hipster comment, but all the other pros far outweigh that, rock and roll with the beard. And so it's being able to look. Right. And it doesn't make you distinct. Right. What's the point of wearing a beard? Well, there are plenty of points of wearing a beard besides just being distinct. And if uniqueness is what you're after, then if society is caught up to the idea of the beard, then you can lament the fact that that's not there. Or you can say, well, I still like the beard. It still looks good. And so I'm going to accomplish that uniqueness through something else. Because the beard isn't the only tool or the only way to actually dress in a way that's unique and still develop that uniqueness and that authenticity against the, the trendiness or the fashion component or the congruency with what people are wearing. Yeah, so if the beard becomes a moot point because it's no longer a unique identifier, find another one and then look at the beard as just a, a, yay, a yay or a nay, but if it's no longer the, the definer of uniqueness, so whether that's a beard or a necklace or suspenders or anything else, if other people ruin the uniqueness of it, oh well, that's life. We're men, we adapt, we find something else to, to make it unique. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Is that Ryan back there? Is that who I'm looking at? Okay, cool. Uh, jewelry. Yeah. Just in general. Other than a watch, I can't handle rings. It makes me feel like I'm swinging the wrong way. You know what I mean? I'm just curious your thoughts. Um, okay, so that's a really good point because there are things that based on your own experience, based on the tribes that you belong to, based on your own personal tastes, that make a ring or something else be inconsistent or incongruent with your story. And so for you, don't wear a ring. But you've got other guys who are able to wear a ton of jewelry. They can stack up a bunch of different bracelets, they can wear a necklace, they can wear a bunch of different rings. You look at somebody like, like Johnny Depp, you know, and he can do that and for him it works because it is congruent with his story. And so again, it's being able to factor in your own personal taste versus the tribe, the expectations, and all those other variables. Now I will tell you one thing that is a little bit more kind of broad and prescriptive when it comes to jewelry for men is if you're going to wear something that is that unique, because in the 21st century in the West right now, wearing anything beyond a watch or a wedding band is attention getting. You know, you're back in Eastern Europe even today, and it isn't that unique. It doesn't draw that much attention, but here and now it does. And so if you are going to be drawing attention through a signature piece or through a signature accessory like that, it needs to be something that actually has a story to it. You can't say, I picked it up at Forever 21 because that, that doesn't work with what our aesthetic goals as men are. It has to be something that a friend gave it to me or from an ex or I picked it up while I was traveling here or like I've got, I don't wear it, I probably should wear it more often, but I've got a necklace that has um, a coin from the East India Trading Company that my wife bought for me while she was traveling up in Portland. And so it's actually like a, like a coin from there. That's a pretty cool little thing. It's a unique piece and you know, there's some history to it. That's the kind of thing that you can get away with a whole lot better than something that you saw at Aldo and picked up for like 20 bucks while you were doing an impulse buy as you were checking out with your shoes. Yeah. Okay, I got time for maybe one more right here. Yeah, my question is, uh, how much do you think that money matters in regards to clothing? Because, for example, I mean, let's say you're into like uh, white sneakers. Mm -hmm. You can get like a $40 pair of um, Stan Smiths, let's uh -huh. say, or you can get like a $450 pair of uh, Common Prius or something like that. You know your and, stuff. <laughs> and it's basically the same sneaker or right. very similar. And the reason I ask that is because I, I kind of feel that in certain contexts, I mean, there are people that can size you up just by your clothing Absolutely. and they're going to say oh this is i mean this guy's ni nicely dressed but this is a, like a 200 dollar man right and this one over here is like a 2000 dollar man right right so right. i mean what is your take in regards to uh, what do you think i love this okay there's a couple different answers to this question but we can use this and apply the same lens of these different principles within there for the majority of men in here if they were to see you walk in in a pair of 50 dollars stan smiths versus a 450 dollar pair of common projects no difference right and so within this particular tribal context, doesn't matter. But if you are within a tribe where it benefits you to wear the nicer shoes, 
there are more advantages to wearing those than the extra $400, then it's worth it to do that. Now, as you're trying to figure out what your own growth and development are, one of the best things that you can do, especially as you go through, this is one of the topics that I hit on when I spoke here last year, is there's a difference between a developing stage in your style and a deliberate stage. And for you guys who are just trying to experiment with new things and you're trying to figure stuff out, you may not know if white sneakers work for you. And so what you do is you buy the $50 Stan Smiths or like the $30 pair from H&M and you wear them for two or three months and you see if they work. If they do, then maybe it's worth it to turn around and invest in the higher quality pair. That's the same thing with suits, that's the same thing with t-shirts because I will tell you guys that when it comes to clothing, not only as far as what's being signaled, but the way that it's made, the way that it wears, how comfortable it is, the texture to it, all these other things, you can wear like a thousand dollar sport coat and have it look better and be worth the money compared to a $50 sport coat from H&M, but you don't want to start off investing that kind of money if you don't know if that piece is going to work for you. So start experimenting with cheap stuff. If it works, I know this is kind of hard because you're like, I already own a pair of white sneakers, but double down, get more deliberate and buy a more expensive pair once you know that it works as long as the advantages are there to do that. All right guys, I'm out of time. Um, like I said, I've got I'm here for the next couple of days. Please come talk to me. I would love to answer you guys' questions. And thank you for, uh, for letting me come and talk to you guys today.